Hey guys, Jason here with another Duel Masters video. I have always maintained that the right way to play the DMTCG is the way that is most enjoyable to you. Despite its long-time discontinuation in an official capacity, there remain passionate fans spread across the globe that continue to enjoy this wonderful game. But while we can all agree that Duel Masters is great, we don't all agree on what the best rule set is. While an unmodified rule set less Bombazar is perhaps the most common way to play, the Finnish, IDC, and Retro OCG rule sets are some other notable examples. Of course, we too have our own views on what makes for the best gameplay experience, and with Season 3 right around the corner, I think now would be the perfect time to give a proper breakdown of our own house rules, the gauntlet format, if you will. The first set of house rules I'll cover pertain to the fundamental rules of the game, of which we have two. Well, actually three, but I'll get into the third one much later in the video. The first one is deck size being limited to 40 cards, which was something we implemented all the way back in Season 1. So far, I'd say that many people seem to agree with this one, but for the longest time, I struggled to articulate why I felt that the 40 card limit was the way to go. I can get into arguments touching on the overall deck building experience, control's place in the meta, and wanting to align with Japan, but what it ultimately boils down to is how the game's mechanics were originally balanced around each player having a 40 card deck. In my humble opinion, this is how the game was meant to be played. The second fundamental rule is the use of a stack system, which we also implemented back in Season 1. For those unfamiliar, a stack system is one where effects of cards resolve in reverse order, so whichever effect is triggered most recently is what activates first. For example, if I summon Bronze Arm Tribe while I have Mist Rius out, Bronze Arm being the most recent activation means I will always ramp mana from Bronze Arm before drawing from Mist Rius. A few people in our comments section have pointed out that the official TCG ruling was that the player chooses the order in which they want their effects to resolve, but we didn't know about this when deciding on a ruling so we just went with what DMP was doing. To be honest, I don't think it makes that big of a difference because the DM TCG doesn't have too many wild interactions like other games do, so we're just going to keep going with the stack system. Hashtag DMP has done nothing wrong. The next set of house rules I'm going to talk about is a ban list, or as it is known in an official DM capacity, the Hall of Fame. Cards here are generally considered to be unfair, overpowered, or have an overall negative effect on gameplay experience. In general, our objective when targeting certain cards for the Hall of Fame is not to completely kill a strategy, but rather to make it feel less unfair. Like the official OCG and DMP ban lists, we've kept our targets to 1 and 0 copies. I don't think a semi-limited category is entirely necessary, and I think the beauty of the Hall of Fame's conception lies in its simplicity. As at the time of recording, the only card we have banned is of course Bombazar Dragon of Destiny. Bombazar being ban-worthy seems to be unanimously agreed upon by the fanbase, and I totally get it. We never had Bombazar in any of our formats, including Season 0, and I think things are fine the way they are. I can imagine living in a world where Bombazar is legal at one copy, but I think all that would really do is give a boost to medium speed or slower decks running Fire and Nature. I guess this can be seen as a positive or negative, depending on what you want your meta to be like. Before I get into the cards we have limited to one copy, there is one thing I need to get off my chest. While I do feel that the 40 card limit does more good than bad, one of its unfortunate downsides is the emergence of deck out as an extremely viable win condition and deck. So even though our Hall of Fame is essentially dedicated to nerfing deck out, I still stand by the 40 card limit. With that out of the way, the next card on the Gauntlet Hall of Fame is Miraculous Snare. When we started Season 2, I already knew I wanted to hit this card, because not only do I think it's extremely powerful in terms of function and versatility, but I also felt strongly about this card's ability to make for a negative gameplay experience. I love situations where the game escalates to big, expensive creatures putting in work, and given its cost, Snare just scoffs at that. 
I'm prepared to admit that my personal dislike for the card was the leading factor in Snare being hit, but for more objective reasons, I think we need to consider how it really doesn't have a lot of counterplay, and how it pushes one of the best decks in deck out way over the top. The final card on our Hall of Fame is Slash Charger. Slash Charger being overpowered is of course due to the 40 card limit, making winning by deck out a lot easier. I'll preface this discussion by saying I think that deck out as a win condition adds an extremely valuable dimension to the game, and it's something that absolutely should exist. But I also think it should be reserved for less common occurrences, like punishing players for overextending, rewarding the winner of a battle of attrition, or acting as the final out in an otherwise unwinnable situation, and not something players can easily build their deck around. Really, my problem isn't with deck out as a win con, my problem is with the fact that multiple slash chargers makes it too accessible, to the point that it defeats the win condition's intended purpose. My goal for limiting slash charger is to make it so that the slash user must actually work for the deck out, rather than being able to easily achieve it by blatantly abusing the mechanics of the game. To conclude my discussion on our card restrictions, I think it's important to touch on what we didn't hit. Our watch list, therefore, refers to cards that we aren't restricting or regulating outright. Instead, they are cards which we are actively refraining from playing with until we can properly determine the best way to deal with them. Gone to the Warrior Savage is a card that I think is pretty overpowered, and I really don't like how centralizing he can be. If you notice, our only deck that runs him is the meme deck from Season 2, Mikey's Pliers, and that's so he can carry it. I honestly don't know if Gonta is truly Hall of Fame worthy, since he can at least be soft countered by Spiralgate, which we're already putting into most decks. But then this begs the question, does this qualify as over-centralizing? It's honestly hard to say. On top of this, Gonta being an aggrocentric card makes the decision even trickier, because I find aggrocentric strategies to be less resilient to regulations than control-centric ones. And the other watch-listed card is Reap and Sow. This is a card with a great track record in the OCG, and I honestly fear its ability to completely gatekeep certain decks, but given how little it is talked about in a modern TCG setting, I think there's a good chance it won't be too overpowered. I think it will probably be like Wave Strikers in that it will completely dominate things that can't deal with it, like non-rush decks with no ramp, and it won't be too useful against anything that can. But I'll admit that this is just my prediction, since we haven't really played with the card. There's only one way to truly find out. Now to address the elephant in the room. When talking about card restrictions in the DMTCG, I think many players will be quick to bring up Cranium Clamp and Soul Swap. There's no doubt in my mind that these are some of the most powerful cards ever printed in Duel Masters 20 year history, but I don't think we need to restrict these in our format. To keep the discussion brief, I see these cards as great vehicles for getting fringe playable strategies off the ground, and as great consistency boosters for many decks. I also want to note that the ways in which they function allow them to be used in a wide variety of strategies, especially in contrast to the cards we have on our watch list and Hall of Fame. Necessary Evils is the term I used to use when internally discussing these cards with the Gauntlet team, but to be honest, I generally don't consider them to have an overall negative effect on gameplay experience, since the 40 card limit kind of keeps their degeneracy in check anyway. To finish off, the last set of house rules I'll discuss is errata. These are revisions to card text that are largely meant to address the same issues as the Hall of Fame, with the most emphasis being on negative gameplay experience. All of the errata we've applied so far are focused on preventing absurd hand sizes and or snowballing game states. The first of our revisions is the only non-DM13 card, Mistrius Sonic Guardian. We adopted one of the DMP changes, which only allows users to draw until they have 6 cards in hand, though we kept it optional. We did this to prevent excessively large hand sizes. I know this is technically a nerf, but in reality, this should change very little, because having 6 cards in hand and Miss Rius on board means the user is in a strong position anyway. 
The next revision is the most important one because of how pervasive the card is, its judgment of the flame's spear and water's blade. Again, we adopted the DMP ruling and made it so that the user could only draw until they had 5 cards in hand. Without the regulation, it felt as if Judgment extended a player's lead by an absurd amount to the point of being unfair, but it didn't feel right to Hall of Fame Judgment from right out the gate, so we just instituted this erratum to limit some of its upside. Our third card revision is our biggest one, and it relates to Dolgeza Strong Striker. This revision includes a change to a fundamental rule of the game, which I mentioned at the start of the video. The reason I'm covering it here is because Dolga is the only card it affects. We've made the decision to treat giant insects as giants, which means Dolgeza gains sympathy from and draws cards for giant insects. The treatment of giant insects as giants is a ruling that came out in the early 2010s in the OCG, though I'm having a hard time finding documentation of this and it was also applied to DMP upon the release of set 16. This rule change is technically not period accurate, because the change in the OCG happened way after the TCG died, but it was the only way we could make Dolgeza viable for season 3, and we really wanted to make a Dolgeza deck. As we tested, we realized that having access to Soul Swap and Giant Insect to Sympathy Bait had a negative effect on gameplay experience because it allowed Dolgeza to snowball way too hard. We found that streaming multiple Dolgeza in a single turn was a bit too easy, largely because of how many cards it could dig through. As you can imagine, playing two Dolgezas in one turn while having a full board and oversized hand is pretty ridiculous. We wanted to keep Dolgeza viable while avoiding unfairness, so like Judgment, we are having the draw effect cap at 5 cards in hand. The final revision is for Asteria Heaven's Blessing Elemental. I'd say this card is probably the weakest out of the errated cards, but I still feel the regulation is necessary. Asteria lets the user draw a card every time the opponent draws outside the start of their turn. At face value, this is not unreasonable, but when a player can stick two or more Asteria, it gives rise to situations where the game hopelessly spirals out of control, yet doesn't come much closer to ending. I didn't like this dynamic, so we agreed that, like Mistrius, the user could only draw until they had 6 cards in hand. At this point, the Asteria player is still sufficiently rewarded and remains in a strong position, but the opponent isn't completely disincentivized from attempting a comeback. I thought about making the effect only one Asteria can activate per turn, but I felt that it was still necessary to reward the player for sticking multiple Asteria. And that brings me to the end of the video. If you've been paying close attention, you might have noticed that we were very deliberate in designing the house rules to still operate within the confines of the original cards. That is to say, if you were to read the original card text, our revisions would still technically make sense, and applying the house rule will merely resemble the player always choosing for things to resolve a certain way. For example, only ever opting to draw up to 5 cards with judgement. In a game like the DMTCG, I do believe that this is the best way to handle revisions, and I think this philosophy helps keep our videos accessible to others while fun and fair for us. So let me know what you think of our house rules, and feel free to share some house rules you use when playing with friends down in the comments. Anyway, as usual, thanks for watching, stay safe, and we'll see you guys next time.